for our final unit of the course. We'll examine a variety of states around the world, looking at how these largest and most complex societies operate. Because we all live in a state-organized society ourselves, we might expect the structure and functioning of such cultures to be familiar. However, what we'll see in this unit is that there are as many ways to organize a state as there are chiefdoms, tribes, and bands. Let's begin by reviewing just exactly what a state is. In the classification system developed by Elm and Service, states are the largest and most complex societies that humans form. They're usually marked by the presence of cities in writing, but not always. They are always agricultural or industrial because the number of people is large enough, often in the millions, the simpler, less intensive subsistence strategies can't supply the people with enough food. Because they're so large, governing so many people is a difficult task. In chiefdoms, the chief himself, along with a few sub-chiefs or his council, is usually able to manage the chiefdom's economic and social problems. But the millions of citizens in a state go far beyond the capabilities of a small group of politicians. So in states, you see the development of a professional bureaucracy. These are officials whose job it is to oversee just a portion of the government, priests, generals, ministers of state, etc. Each is not just a politician, but an expert in one particular domain of political decision making. The king or president then coordinates the activities of the bureaucracy to meet the needs of the populace. While this is, in theory, how a state's government operates, as we'll see this week with Haiti, it's not always the case. As with any human community, human nature can and does interfere with things causing trouble. But since states are so much larger than the cultures we've been studying, their problems become all the more significant. Let's turn now to Haiti itself and see exactly how Haitian culture operates as a state. The nation of Haiti makes up the western third of the island of Hispaniola, the second largest island in the Caribbean. The eastern two-thirds make up the nation of the Dominican Republic. Hispaniola lies about 600 miles southeast of Florida, and the United States has had a persistent influence on Haitian culture throughout the 20th century and into the 21st. Haiti is about 11,000 square miles of territory, formed into two long peninsulas stretching to the west. Along the center line of each peninsula is a mountain chain, so that about half of the Haitian landscape sits more than 1,500 feet above sea level, and half lies on a slope greater than 40 degrees. The island is also at a tropical latitude and subject to sometimes intense rains and hurricanes. In such a setting, erosion can be a very difficult problem, and we'll see that it lies behind some of Haiti's persistent troubles. To understand Haiti's current culture, we must understand its history of political and social conflict. The island of Hispaniola was first explored by Christopher Columbus, who found a large population of native farmers living there. These people, known as the Taino, were widespread throughout the Caribbean in the late 15th century, with Hispaniola's population in the hundreds of thousands. Spanish colonists took control of Hispaniola and reduced most of the natives to slavery. By the middle part of the 16th century, the Taino were essentially wiped out, and colonists began importing African slaves to replace them. In 1697, possession of the western part of Hispaniola passed from Spain to France, who named their colony San Domingo. The situation in colonial San Domingo was not atypical for the period in the Caribbean. Haiti, like all state-organized societies, maintained a strict social hierarchy based on class. Classes are large groups of potentially unrelated people who have markedly different levels of wealth, power, and prestige. In Haiti, this class system came to be based largely on one's race. Those of European ancestry, especially French ancestry, formed the upper class, wealthy, powerful, and respected members of society that owned most of the land and resources, including slaves. At the bottom of the social hierarchy was the slave class, those of mostly West African ancestry who literally owned nothing, not even their own lives. In between were the mulattoes, a middle class of free, biracial people with mixed European and African ancestry. Another lower middle class called Afranchi was made up of freed slaves, poor, disenfranchised whites, and others with little political or social influence. By the turn of the 19th century, the tensions among these various classes reached a tipping point. 
By far, the slave class outnumbered everyone else, but the mulatto and Afranchi classes were growing in power and influence. A freed slave named Toussaint Louvator, who'd become governor, took advantage of the chaos to declare independence from France. Though Louvator himself was eventually tried and executed by Napoleon, Saint Domingue remained independent and was soon renamed Haiti. From 1804, Haiti was the first independent nation in Latin America, the second in the Western Hemisphere, after the United States, and the only one where African descended people held the primary reins of power. Unfortunately, its post colonial history was, by most standards, an unmitigated disaster. Colonial societies are usually ethnically quite diverse. Haitian culture combined African, French, Spanish, and some remaining Taino influences. The governments of colonies are also structured on resource extraction and coercion of the native populace. France ruled San Domingue for its own benefit, not the benefit of the Haitian people. This strategy resulted in a local economic base that was depleted, with little infrastructure to produce goods for its own use, and a lot of simmering resentment. Decolonization, the process of the colonial power withdrawing and returning the colony to self-rule, was not planned with any eye toward the long-term prosperity of Haiti. One day, more or less, France was gone and Haiti was independent. Its new ruling class still sought to rule with the same strategies they had learned under colonial rule, coercion and exploitation. The 19th century history of Haitian politics can only be described as chaotic. Dozens of would-be dictators and governments came and went. During this time, most Haitian peasants kept their heads down and simply focused on survival, but others sought to use the chaos to their own benefit. In such an environment, the only reliable, secure profession was that of soldier. The cacos, or piques, as they were known, were a class of professional mercenaries that grew up in the 19th century, selling their services to whichever would-be president for life was willing to pay the most. As soon as one was installed in the capital, they changed allegiance to another. From an individual perspective, this was a way to ensure one's own job security, but it did nothing to ensure the stability and prosperity of Haiti. In 1915, the U.S. invaded Haiti and installed itself as a military government. This was ostensibly to establish stability and security on America's doorstep, and the U.S. did in fact institute some helpful reforms. However, when self-rule returned in 1934, Haitian politics fell back into its customary pattern of turmoil. That ended in 1957, when for the first time a free and fair election led to the peaceful transition of power and the installation of Francois Duvalier as the president of Haiti. Called Papa Doc because he had previously worked as a doctor, Duvalier led with a kind of Afro-Haitian nationalism, encouraging the Haitian people to embrace their African roots and reject Euro-American influences. He was also a terrifying dictator. Like many of his predecessors, he quickly set about squelching any dissent using his own private militia, known colloquially as the Tonton Makout. Unlike the Cacos of the previous generations, these men were loyal to Duvalier personally, not his bank account. Tonton Makout means Uncle Knapsack in Haitian Creole, a boogeyman character who'd show up and steal naughty children in his knapsack. This is exactly what the Tonton Makout would do to Duvalier's political enemies, most of whom were never seen again. Tens of thousands of Haitians were killed in this way. When Papa Doc Duvalier died of natural causes in 1971, his 19-year-old son, Jean-Claude, appropriately known as Baby Doc, succeeded him. Baby Doc Duvalier ruled in much the same vein as his father until a revolution in 1986 sent him into exile in France. The last 30 years of Haitian history have seen a succession of governments come and go, but increasing political stability and democratic principles on the whole. That comparative stability, however, hasn't done much to resolve the very real problems that have plagued everyday Haitians for centuries. The Haitian economy can be summed up well by one word, poverty. After centuries of colonial exploitation and political chaos, the people of Haiti live under crushing poverty. The average yearly income for a Haitian in 2015 was only $750, making Haiti the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Most Haitians are subsistence farmers, eating their own crops grown on small plots of privately owned land. 
Staple crops are maize, beans, bananas, and sweet potatoes, supplemented occasionally by sheep, pigs, and other familiar European livestock. The large commercially oriented plantations of the colonial period focused mostly on sugarcane, which is no longer a major crop in Haiti, and timber harvesting. Cutting of timber escalated after independence as rich landowners sought to continue extracting wealth from the land. U.S. and European timber companies were only too happy to exploit the Haitian forests, and no one paid much mind to the environmental consequences. Today, only a few percent of Haiti's natural forest cover is left. The ensuing erosion and depletion of the soil's nutrients have reduced much of the land to only marginal fertility, making it that much harder for Haitian farmers to make a living. Our second reading for this week describes a project that had great success in resolving some of these issues. The majority of Haitians have adapted to their own poverty, as I said, by simply keeping their heads down and working to survive. They remain rural subsistence farmers, working their small plots for their own benefit. Those who don't wish to farm have at least one other option, moving to the city. Port-au-Prince, the Haitian capital, is by far the largest city in the nation, with over 3 million inhabitants. What little wage labor there is in Haiti is mostly available here, but the sheer size of the city makes it that much more difficult to obtain basic food and services there, and the city dwellers are frequently no better off than their rural family. Haitian culture today is an amalgam of the cultural traditions brought together in the colonial period. Residence, kinship, and marriage customs all follow European patterns to the extent that the poverty of the community allows. The official language of the nation remains French, and the official religion is Roman Catholicism. However, in practice, both language and religion have become something radically different from their European origins. While standard French is still spoken by many Haitians and is still used by governments, schools, and businesses, it's not the language of everyday conversation in most Haitian households. Haitians speak Haitian Creole, a language unique to Haiti and its people. Creoles in general are a category of languages that often evolve in colonial settings. People with radically different languages must still live and work together, so over time, a hybrid of all their languages evolves. Haitian Creole draws on French vocabulary, African grammar and pronunciation, and other bits of Spanish, English, and even some Taino influence. It is generally not intelligible to those who only speak one of the original languages. Because of its connections with African origins and those unable to afford education in standard French, Haitian Creole has traditionally been associated with the lower classes. Those of the ruling class have traditionally spoken French, and doing so is an assertion of upper-class sensibilities. But in modern Haiti, Haitian Creole is increasingly seen as a matter of national pride. Creole is increasingly used in ever more formal contexts. Like language, Haitian religion is also a unique product of its colonial past. The official religion of the nation is Roman Catholicism, and almost all Haitians attend a Catholic church at least sometimes. But daily religion is much more dominated by Haitian Voudan, better known in the U.S. as Voodoo. Voudan, like Creole, is a form that grows out of the colonial setting. Anthropologists call such religions syncretic. Voudan reflects a combination of ideas drawn mostly from Catholicism, practiced by the French colonial masters, and from West African native traditions practiced by slaves. Early in the colonial period, slave owners insisted their slaves convert to Catholicism. The slaves, to placate their masters, did so superficially, but in reality, they used Catholic trappings to hide their native practices. Over time, the surface and underlying beliefs grew together, creating a third, wholly different religious tradition. Modern Voudan is not Catholicism done wrongly, or African native traditions hidden behind Catholic trappings. It is a wholly developed, intricate theology of its own that addresses all the great existential questions of life in its own way. Worship focuses on the Grand May, or Great Master, a creator deity equated with the Christian God. Access to the Grand May is made through a variety of Loa, spirits and lesser deities who are invoked in ritual. These Loa possess worshipers during rituals and deliver their blessings or messages to other worshipers. These possession trances are brought on by drumming, dancing, and occasional animal sacrifices all of which are common parts of African religious practice. 
One more note should be made about Vudan. Much of how American pop culture depicts voodoo only applies to the bokor, or sorcerer. Like most religious traditions, Vudan accepts that some evil people can use the rituals and powers accessed through Vudan to harm others. These wicked sorcerers are called bokors, and things like voodoo dolls, zombies, and curses are all their special domain. To accuse an ordinary practitioner of Vudan of using a voodoo doll is highly insulting, an attack on their character. Finally, let's look briefly at the Haitian diaspora. A diaspora occurs when members of an ethnic group leave behind their original homeland and live dispersed among other ethnic groups in foreign countries. Thanks to the centuries of poverty and turmoil in Haiti, immigrating to other countries has long been attractive. Haiti's current population is about 10 million, and about 2 million ethnic Haitians live outside the country most in the neighboring Dominican Republic or the United States. These immigrants originally were what anthropologists call sojourn immigrants, intending to stay in the foreign country for a brief sojourn before returning to their home country. Sojourn immigration is usually undertaken for work, with immigrants returning home once a sufficient amount of money has been earned. In the latter part of the 20th century, however, many Haitian immigrants to the U.S. came with the intention of staying permanently. The 900,000 or so Haitians living in the U.S. today are mostly found in New York City and Florida. Rather than earning money here and then returning home, their strategy is to stay in the U.S. indefinitely and send money to their families in Haiti in the form of remittances. This money makes up a substantial portion of the Haitian economy. Over time, if possible, they also seek to bring more members of their family to the U.S. But all is not simple and easy for Haitians in the U.S. They're generally ineligible for asylum under U.S. law, since their motivation for immigrating is economic rather than political. Thus, many Haitian immigrants arrive in the U.S. illegally and are subject to deportation if caught. Also, since they're of African descent, Haitians are often lumped together with African Americans by other social groups. This occurs even though Haitians and African Americans have markedly different cultures and histories, and sometimes even have conflicting interests. Being equated with African Americans can be taken as an insult to Haitian culture, creating friction between Haitians and their neighbors. These concerns continue to complicate the lives of Haitians in the U.S. and probably will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Haiti is a state very close to our own nation geographically, but one with a very different past that produced a very different culture. Its long history of political turmoil and poverty illustrates the problems that arise in colonial and post-colonial settings. However, Haitian culture is nevertheless vibrant, a unique expression of the lives and identities of the Haitian people.